We're bringing four chapters to dominated this house on the drums and bass and stuff. And frankly, all the girls thought he was a lot cooler than me. <laughs> I was playing Paganini, I was the concert master, you know, I had all this chamber music experience, I could play a thousand times on the violin. But this kid, he was cooler than me, frankly. What he was doing was completely different. Nobody else was doing what he was doing, because it was his music, you know? And, and in that way, I really believe that creativity is the ultimate equalizer. You know, we all preach to our kids that, uh, you know, that, that they have a unique personality and, and that that's an important asset. And, we, and we, we say that we believe that, but in the culture of classical music education, we do not show that through what we do. Now that is not to say that the process of playing classical music is uncreative. Of course it's creative, but we can all agree that there is something else at work when we talk about creative musicians who arrange music, who compose music, who improvise music who do what I just did, which maybe some people may not like. But there's a few people that will be compelled by it because it's different, because it's its, its own thing. Like, I have my own sound. Some people can hear two notes and say, ah, that's Christian House. If you think about your favorite artists, I don't care if it's Joni Mitchell or Stravinsky or Jimi Hendrix or Miley Cyrus, I would suggest that the thing that compels you about that artist is not the artist's virtuosity, but it is their distinctive sound. It's their, it's their unique personality that they've manifest and evolved into through their work. It's the same thing that happens, it's the same phenomena that we observe with every child who we give a crayon to and a piece of paper at age two. And we don't say anything, we just give them the crayon, we give them the paper, and they doodle. They doodle. We don't say, wait, 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 hold the crayon just like this. You've got to have fundamental crayon technique holding before you can be creative with the crayon. We don't teach them to draw on the lines first. We just say, doodle, have fun. And, um, and over time, we start to see their, their, um, their signature, their, their imprint, their stamp, their personality. You know, it's tangible. It becomes reified in their work. So by the time that kid is five or six, and they do a show and tell at school, you go and you see 60 kids, all their, their works on the wall, and you go right up to yours and say, that's my kids. You don't have to see their signature on it, you just know because you see their voice in it that's come through from just doing the doodles. And that's the same kind of thing I think uh, fundamentally we should do with violins and cellos and, and violas and music in general. We should encourage doodling. Um, so as I said, when I was 16, I sort of noticed that my friends who were only just beginning their musical training were already doing things as musicians that were very different from the things that I had done. Um, so number one, they were creating music. They were improvising, arranging songs, composing their totally unique original compositions. Um, and I had never done that. Now, number two, they seemed to have an understanding of the music in a different way than I did as a classical musician. So in the rock band, the drummer knew the bass part and the bass player knew the guitar part. And, they sort of had this understanding about it. Um, number three, of course, you know, it was a different style of music. So, so those are the three things. And I think that this conversation about alternative styles or eclectic styles, I think it becomes very convoluted because we haven't really separated the issues. I'd like to propose that we separate the issues into those three categories. One is creativity. How do we facilitate, encourage, nurture, teach cre the creative process in different ways? Number two is Music theory, understanding music, looking under the hood of the car. You know, we're like race car drivers that are highly paid, but if we get a flat tire, we're like, call mom. You know, because we have no idea, we can't fix our scores, we don't, you know, it's just not what we learned. We, we just didn't learn that stuff. Um, number three is having exposure to a broad array of different styles of music. Uh, not only is it fun, not only um, is it relevant to our, you know, our peer group, but um, it also makes us better classical musicians, believe it or not. Um, so, and a lot of people, sometimes when people say, oh, thanks for coming, that was fun. You know, I, I think that's great, I'm glad it was fun. But I also sometimes read between the lines on that. Uh, maybe that's just my own self-consciousness, maybe that's my own insecurity, you know. Um, but I feel like there are a lot of musicians in the world, and there was a, recently uh, an article in the, um, in the music journal, the National Music J Journal called, um, the Convergence of Media and the Participatory Culture, Music Education and the Participatory Culture, something like this. And it sort of made the point that like, you can look all around the world and people are sharing, posting, creating music. People that aren't educated you know, in our system. 
they're, they're sharing, and, th and this is what we, we want to, you know, our kids and all of us, what we want to do, we want to create things and we want to share them. Everybody in here has probably shared some witty quip on Facebook in the last week, right? We're so creative in other aspects of our lives, that's what it is to be human nature. We want to bring that into music. That's, it's not just fun, it's, it's, what, it's what music is about. Music is about community, music is about humanity. Um, and there's a lot of people that play Stevie Wonder or they play uh, folk music of various cultures, they play jazz, and they take it just as seriously as classical musicians take classical music. So it's not just fun, it's, it's real music. And if, and, if, and if you haven't been exposed to mariachi music, or you haven't been exposed to flamenco music, or you haven't been exposed to you know, the culture of heavy metal, you know, punk rock kids that are really serious about what they do as artists, that's cool, I don't hold it against you. Um, but it's real for somebody, you know? It's real for somebody until you get up close and personal to it, you may not have a chance to really appreciate the richness of that particular musical culture. <clears throat> not only is it more fun for me to have the variety in my life of being able to do different things as a musician every day of the week, but it also has made me marketable. It, it, give, it, it gives me the opportunity to work. And if that last chair second violin player, who you very well know is never going to get a full-time job in an orchestra, <laughs> do you want him to have the opportunity to work as a musician? Because facilitating his creative advancement will allow him to do that. I know people that make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and they don't play an instrument. They compose music on a laptop for films, for commercials, for commercials that you watch on your TV every day and people watch all the way around the world. So the variety, the fulfillment, the enrichment that I get from playing music that I create, but also this concept of lifelong learning. You know, how many of our kids are going to put their violin on the shelf after high school because they're not going to take the extra effort to find the infrastructure necessary to play classical music. They're not Condoleezza Rice, they don't have three friends that they can play chamber music with every Sunday. And, they, they, and, and they're not capable of like putting together an orchestra with a library, with a conductor, with a recital hall. You know, these people should be able to continue to incorporate music in their lives, in human, social, communal ways. With their family, around a campfire, uh, at their church, playing in a, in a bar on the weekends, whatever it is. And I know we all want those things. So sorry to go on my soapbox, but I'm gonna show you now really quickly, hopefully how we can get into address all of these areas that I just talked about. Uh, creativity, music theory, and a diversity of exposure to different styles. So if you could get your instruments out, playing position, we'll get started. <laughs> So the first thing I'm going to do is, is from the stacks of the page, I'm going to pick one note from each chord. So each of those stacks has three notes in it that are doubled up everywhere in first position. And I'm just picking one of the notes in each stack. Can we try? One, two, red, A. of all the, the notes in music are harmony. And it's so, sort of the, harmony is like the, the grammar, it's like the alphabet of music. And um, so Paco Bell, when he started off, he did this, he chose one chord tone for during every chord for his melody. And he did one other thing which is called voice leading. Voice leading simply means that you move the smallest distance from note in one chord to the note the next chord. You can go up a step, down a step, sometimes they'll, they'll stay the same. Let's do it with two notes per chord. Something like that. Ready, go. Miss can 
misconception number one. Improvisation is intuitive. Improvisation is something that you either have a personality for or you don't. In improvisation is something you need to have ears to do. Everybody in this room just improvised 100% perfect lines. Because as long as you play a chord tone, you're essentially playing in unison. It's the most consonant sound you can have is in unison. You're playing in unison with the harmony. This is very formulaic. It's, it's very sensible. It's like easy math, right? So um, a lot of people teach a scale-based approach to improvisation. I've heard, I'm sure you've heard it before. Uh, just use this scale and kind of use your ears to find it. If you land on the wrong note, then just move to the other note or whatever. That has limited, uh, you know, a limited kind of success in, in certain contexts. But a chord tone-based approach to improvisation is going to be 100% uh, every time, just like you just experienced. Um, and it's also going to really teach people about the harmony. We're going to use it in a lot of different ways. So now I'm going to go into um, um, another stylistic domain, uh, bluegrass. Let's say Paco Bell was from, uh, from uh, uh, Kentucky. <laughs> So um, the bass line is going to be the one area in the music that is an exception to the rule of voice leading. 95% of the time, the bass line will express the root of the chord on the downbeat of the chord. So let's just play our simple bluegrass bass line, shall we? And you can look at the top of your sheet to see just the letter if you want to do that. So D, D, A, A, that kind of thing. Ready, go. <laughs> Times I've gone, uh, I've, I've talked to teachers. Say, I'm going to come to the class. I'm going to work with you. I like to teach kids about music theory. I'm going to show them about improvisation. We're going to talk about deep concepts related to music. Blah blah. They say, all we really want you to do is just teach us a chop. Can you just teach us how to chop? Chop, because they think you know uh, that alternative styles is all about chops. I'm like, chopping is a tree in a forest, right? <laughs> but 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 since we're there, let's just do a chop on this, okay? <laughs> So we're going to get our groove going very simply, just throw, throw a little chop on there. You can cover your strings with your left hand, sort of like as if you were playing harmonics, and you just kind of drop and stick. Don't bounce. Stick. Cool. Um, and uh, and uh, now again, I'll tell a lot of people, like, actually, some people get really obsessed about, I want a proper chop technique. It's like, it's cool. You know? They think it's like flesh or something, you know, whatever. Uh, uh, but, um, and that is, there is sort of like a proper chop technique. So you can, you can play on two strings at once, like D and A, or G and D, or A and E. And you get different kind of sounds there, so then you can, what you could, you can practice this kind of thing. Just see if you can get that going. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, Good. So that's our the foundation of our bluegrass group. And now so we've got our bass line down here, and then the next part sort of filling out is going to be like our inner voices, right? Like our accompanimental uh, harmonic texture. So what we can do is the same thing we did originally, one note per chord, voice led, but we're just going to add down pony, up pony rhythm to it. So something like... Um, so let's try that. One, two, three, four. So this would not be voice leading double stars. Right? But this would be. Um, and don't worry about if you get all of them or if they sound pretty or not. It's, it's not important. The important thing is to see the relationships and sort of experience them, start internalizing them. One, two, three, four. So like, 
like um, let's try that one two three four This is a, an opportune, opportunity for a teachable moment where you can talk about the importance of having your arm on the same plane as the bow. So for example, G string here, E string here. We see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, high school and middle school kids that I've seen and, well, frankly, pros that, that, um, that play like this or they play like this, right? And it, it doesn't really help you to get the contact point. I think part of the reason for this is that you get the same contact point on the string. You get a better sound, you get clearer rhythm. You know, that sort of thing. It's just easier to do. So I'll usually have them do something like... Something like this, to, just so they can kind of like see how their arm, their elbow needs to move with. And it also it's important, I mean, everything I've learned from my classical teachers, you know, that, you're, that you're, your arm sort of leads when you make the string crossing, right? I'm sure you're familiar with all that. Um, and so then, if we're doing this... Then my arm is sort of in between D position and A position, sort of right in between, and then we kind of use the wrist, right? So let's try uh, another variation on the bowing pattern, like um. Go ahead. Iterations of of the uh, of the Paco Bell Canon chord progression. I'm trying to reinforce these these ideas of, of voice leading, of how to create a bass line, how to create inner voice patterns, uh, different strategies for, for playing the melody, um, and also at the same time t teaching a little bit about how that style works. You know, so our so our waltz bass line. Again, I, I usually explain the bass. In, in, this way, in saying that about 95% of the time the bass will express the root of the chord on the downbeat. It could do more than that, but it'll, it'll definitely do that. So our simple waltz bass line would be like, just do this, right? We'll jump in, F sharp. Let's try something with the bass line. Let's, let's, let's put ourselves in the shoes of a bass player. So within that, those really rigid constraints, within those really rigid constraints of, of always needing to play the root of the chord on the downbeat, we can nonetheless improvise in between, right? So I could play, for example, um, Baseline. Everybody, baseline. You're going to play the root of the chord on the downbeat, but in between, you do whatever you want. A one, two, three. two and three, and if you want to do double stops, feel free. Uh, so just jump in. One, two, three. Let's break it up. So we'll do 
something like the. Can you jump in there? Here's that sharp. with the melody again and when you play your your melodic improvisation you can play one note per chord or you can play two or three or six or whatever you want right but focusing on voice leading between um, um, chord tones and let's not confuse it I mean when you're within the D chord you can jump around within that arpeggio as much as you want it's just when you move from the last note that you play on that D chord to go to the A chord where the, the voice leading is really important so, um, so for example, um, um, sometimes one note, sometimes two notes, sometimes three notes, different rhythms. scale tones and chromatic tones. But first of all, I just want to um, uh, clear up again some misconceptions about what scales we use. Because a lot of people think, well, every time there's a new chord, there should be a new, new scale, right? And there's a lot of confusion around the idea of playing different modes. So let me tell you, tell you my take on it. So Paco Bell's Canon is in the key of D. That means that exclusively you can only use the seven notes in the D major scale, just those seven notes, um, all the time all the time. So having said that, we've got a D major chord, so what's the first scale that we play over that D major chord? What's major. the scale? D major. So what about the A major chord? What scale do we use over that? D major. D major. D major. D major. D major. What about the F sharp minor chord? What scale do you think you're going to apply to that chord? D major. Thank you. It is a trick question, and usually I get people on it. But it's something that hold people back, they're like, well, I don't know what scale to use on this chord. I don't know what scale to use on that chord. I don't know what scale to use on that chord. Right? Now, a lot of people will tell you, well, actually, on the D major chord, you're going to play D Ionian. On the A chord, you're going to play A Mixolydian. On the B minor, you'll play B Aeolian, F sharp Phrygian, G Lydian, right? But what is all of that saying? It's all the same key signature. A Mixolydian and F sharp Phrygian, they're all, they all share the same seven notes. They're just confusing ways to, <laughs> to make us think it's harder than it is. But if you realize that you're just using this one scale, um, so, so then what does change? What does change from, from the D major chord to the A major chord? If we're using the same scale, the then what's... The step you started on. What's that? Just the step you started on. Yeah, it's the chord, it's the three notes in the chord. Yeah. And that's the most important thing. And that's the problem I have with the scale-based approach to improvisation, because it's really incomplete. It leads to a sense of success and a sense of like, oh, I could probably do this, but also it never it never quite gets there. It, it, it's sort of people like, they try to like, oh, I'm just gonna use this one scale and hear it with my ears and see if it can work. But then they sort of feel like it doesn't really help. It doesn't go all the way, right? But if you're aware of the chords, um, then you really can, you, it, it always works. <laughs> and you sort of really understand what's happening if, you, if you're aware of the chords. 
Um, so, but here's how I'm going to incorporate the scale, the diatonic scale, <coughs> D major, and also the chromatic tones. Um, I'm just going to do an improvisation. I want to see if you can figure out my formula for playing an improvisation that pretty much works. Like it'll it'll sound fine, right? Um, you might not like all the lines, but it but it'll work. And I want to see if you can figure out what is the formula. How do I you know, how do I navigate between those choices of chord tones, diatonic scale tones, chromatic tones? Sounds okay. Yeah. yeah? That always goes by step, or at least leads by step. So, and then you're doing the actual, like a note that's in the chord on the beat. Ah, that's it. Okay. That's there we go. It, yeah. The, the step and all the other stuff actually, it's it's that I play a note from the chord on the beat. Frankly, I do whatever I want in between. I do anything I want in between. I'll even just play like super chromatic, and let's just see how it sounds. But as long as I play that uh, downbeat, uh, okay. Well, actually, I can play totally chromatic over the whole thing. It wouldn't bother me. It might bother me. <laughs> But again, that's a matter of exposure, too. You know, when I was seven, I think, I love to use the food analogy with music. I think when I was, when I was seven, I used to have a salad which consisted of iceberg lettuce, celery, and Viva Italian dressing. You know, like a typical seven-year-old kid. And my dad would have, like, onions and tomatoes and, you know, carrots and sprouts and all, you know, and, and blue cheese crumbles. That was his thing, blue cheese crumbles. And he was like, try the blue cheese crumbles. I was like, okay. I tried it, was like a tiny, tiny bit. I was like, hmm. You know, and the next day I had it again. I was like, I really like blue cheese crumbles. And so then over time, like, you know, I started to enjoy the richness of blue cheese. So now you can give me like a big, like a huge hunk of broke bird and I could just like, you know. <laughs> but, um, but that's like music. Like you have to be exposed to something and sort of like bite it off a little bit at a time until you can really appreciate the complexity. Yeah, the first time, you, I think I gave my daughter a glass of wine the other day, she's 16, and she just about <laughs> threw up. You know, but that same bottle of wine, you know, you, you know, when people are connoisseurs of wine and you know, you get really into it, but you have to be exposed to it. When I first listened to jazz music at like 18 or 19, I just thought, well, they're not in tune, there's, there's no good rhythm, there's no ensemble, it doesn't make any sense, the phrases don't resolve. It's complete BS. It didn't make any sense, right? <laughs> and that's how it sounds to most people if they're just hearing jazz for the first time. <clears throat> but people that I respected said, no, you really gotta, you gotta stick with it, you know, because you're gonna find that there's something that's really meaningful in there. You're just not, you're just not ready for it yet. So that's just an aside. So can you try this now? So chord tone on the downbeat, anything you want in between. One, and that, that could all include all chord tones, right? <laughs> One, two, three. So this is uh, the um, <clears throat> Jamaican. If, if Pacobel lived in Jamaica, uh, his uh, reggae version 
the baseline, this gives us an, a, a chance again to, to reinforce again what the baseline done is. It plays the root of the chord on the downbeat of the chord, but also can do more than that. In this case, we're going to play the root position arpeggio like this. Can you jump in on that? Here's the F sharp. G. something like this. You want to try that? Double stops, voice led, or triple stops. Nice. Okay. So let's say hard rock version. Did you know... <laughs> Did you know that heavy metal is just a rondo? Did you know that? <laughs> So we can do a Brazilian, a bossa, and a samba, which are the same thing. A samba is a fast um, bossa. Bossa is a slow samba. So we'll play the clave. First of all, how a lot of contemporary music or popular music or whatever you want to call it has a non-fluctuating tempo. It's about groove. It's a different sensibility. You play with the groove, the groove doesn't change. The tempo rather doesn't change, right? And and how we can we can play a lot of we can act more like the rhythm section if we're expressing all of the, the uh, subdivisions with our uh, with our body. So, for example, I don't play. Do it like I could also do it here. Or <laughs> you can practice the bowing, the um, the ghost bowing or, or any of those things slowly by just separating them into like simple rhythms like So um, we're running out of time, so I want to take a, a quick second to offer an opportunity for questions. And I want to pass around this email list. If you sign my email list with your um, email, then I will send you free stuff. Free stuff. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and there is not, if you, if you want to hear from me, like if you want me to come to your school or you want to know more about my online training or my summer camp, my summer workshop, which we will offer <coughs> graduate credits for teacher uh, continuing education towards your master's degree. Um, 
this summer, the Creative Strings Workshop in Columbus, Ohio. It's a one-week program. Um, Central Washington University is going to is going to give you uh, th uh, three um, credits toward a master's degree if you want to come. That's the first time this year. So if you're interested in any of those things, you want to hear from me, you can put your phone number down. But uh, you don't have to, to sign it, but 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 you should. <laughs> uh, um, and I've got some. Uh, so you should have gotten some flyers, hopefully, about the camp, about the online program. My online Creative Strings Academy is a fully online curriculum with over 200 instructional videos, um, several books that I've created, resources. Um, this is a, a thesaurus of, uh, or a, uh, I should say, like an encyclop encyclopedia of arpeggios, jazz arpeggios for cello, viola, violin. This is like called the Violin Harmony Handbook, you know, really theory-based stuff. Uh, the Electric Violin Training Kit, which is an overview on everything you need to know about amplification. Of course, I am sponsored by Yamaha, and uh, I do recommend Yamaha Silent Violin or the Yamaha Pickup. The amp today didn't necessarily showcase the violin that great, but with a good amp. So you can also get this book on, on my website for a dollar if you want, but, but, but not these. These are actually really expensive. Um, <laughs> I've got charts, like good alternative styles charts. And now the cool thing is um, um, that this year, for any schools that I go to, Yamaha and I are working together to essentially gift uh, a free access for all the students in the program to the Creative Strings Academy, the online. It's kind of like the Khan Academy. I'm sure you're aware of this idea of flipping the classroom and what, you know, this whole online, everything's going online. So kids can actually observe a lecture at home and they can do their homework in class working alongside a teacher. Right? I don't know if anybody saw the 60 Minutes feature on that, but I thought it was really fascinating. The idea of flipping the classroom and the, the, the possible advantages to that, that structure. So, <clears throat> so if you are interested in having me come in to your school to work with your kids, um, I've got a couple filler dates in November actually where I'm going to be on the, uh, on the West Coast or the rest of your year, then you will get a two month free access for all your students to this um, very popular um, online training that I've had going for over two years now. Um, so yeah, so feel free to talk to me. And today, if you buy one of my CDs, I will send you the downloads for all of these for free. If you buy one of my CDs. So, um, because I need to get rid of them. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions about anything whatsoever? Or comments? Yes? Okay, so the style. Mm -hmm. I know that's a, a lot of it is by, by ear, but obviously, and, and you talked about the groove back and forth, you know, down up, but how, how do I get my high school kids to really uh, hear that? Just expose them a little bit every day, listening to different styles, and then, of course, the technique of applying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think with any style, just like Mozart and Brahms and you know, Bartok, you're going to have like different conventions and for how you approach that music. I think we take it for granted how much we've devoted to really understanding the difference between an articulation, you know, on Mozart and you know, versus Beethoven or whatever. And it's going to be the same thing with like the way you feel rhythm in a bossa or you know, the you know, the what feels good, you know, or, or all I know is that we worked on those bosses for the Bert Luggins uh, races, but once you came in <laughs> and they had you physically right, you know, all of a sudden they started locking in. But I think a big part of that was just because I gave them like a, I just, I, I just gave them the subdivision. So a lot of times if you play contemporary music, if you're playing it with the orchestra without a drummer, it's like a, it's like a completely different world. As soon as you add drums, it'll lock together. And by the way, you don't need to conduct when you have a drummer. It's one of my pet peeves. Because <laughs> it's, it's a different mentality, right? Yeah. Um, going about getting, I mean, I know you're using loops and different tracks. How, how would you go about making that a feasible setup in your classroom to where you can maybe get a pickup for your instrument? So yeah, I, I would have the way. kids, I would have the kids um, make, make videos, make audios, make multimedia presentations that they submit to you for, uh, for assessment by, by posting a video that you can say, oh yeah, you did this. Or I, would, I have quizzes within my Creative Strings Academy online thing so that they can also do like a reflective essay, like so you can send them to like a YouTube video. But watch this video, what do you think about it? You know, answer this question about this, that, and the other. You know, um, <clears throat> I think that if you had uh, lab stations, you know, in your, in your facility, that you could send people to like work on it, you know, one, one at a time, or you could have people work on stuff as small groups, breakout groups, um, maybe where just one person is set up to the loop pedal. Um, 
but I, I think it would be cool to do more of that. I do a lot of that when I work with a program, I'll have them break out. Like we'll do what, what we do with Papa Bell's Can and I'll say now break out in quartets and go and do your own version and come back performal with us. Or you could say go home and you know record yourself doing your own arrangement or your own mashup or your own whatever. A blend of drag and drop softwares and longhand techniques like what we do today, I think is good. In other words, if they're working on GarageBand and they're just dropping a chord progression in and dropping a sequence, and that's still useful because they're creating, they're getting this process of creating. But ultimately, we want them also to understand the real nitty gritty of the harmony and apply it on their instrument as well, if possible. I don't know if that answers. Yeah. Yeah. I have a group on Facebook called Creative String Players. So you're welcome to join that too. And we, we have like lots of people, we just ask and answer like really, really geeky questions related to this stuff all the time. And so like there's probably threads about that kind of thing. We get like the community uh, engaging you on that. Creative string players on Facebook, you can join there. Any other questions about anything? I'm interested in your feedback. Is this, do you see this as just being kind of like light, like the, the thing that you add? Or do you, does anybody see this as like being like real, like a real, like interesting? <laughs> I think a lot of teachers, you know, kind of right off the old styles thing, are like, eh, it's kind of this supplemental, like, you know, when we when we don't want to, when we've worked too hard for a long time. I mean, I mean, I mean, yeah. Chris, well, Chris was at my school yesterday, and he spent four hours there, poor guy. And you know, every 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 hour was was a little more entertaining, and he just he engaged the kids all the time. I will tell you, it's it's well worth it more than well worth it. And the really neat thing, later on during the day, my colleagues would come to me and just annoyed at me. He said, man, you had some cool guy in today. What's the big deal? <laughs> and, and now all the kids want to be string, string players. So doggone, how about that? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and he was at my school on Wednesday. I have an, um, an alternate style class, so I think, and I'm, it's been a steep learning curve for me as a classical musician, so, you know, I guess the answer is yes. I really want to. And I don't. I look at it as a serious um, uh, body of knowledge. You know, uh, it's just hard for me to teach it, not being really well versed in that. Right, so, right, right. so we just sure. little by little, like the whole. It's electric. It's an electric orchestra. So, if you had a question about, I can tell you what I've learned over the last couple of years about mm -hmm. equipment. And Chris was really helpful with that as well. You know, and we have a guitarist couple guitars and electric bass and drums in this class. So I can give you a lot of first-hand uh, knowledge about what I've learned in the last couple of years about that. What's well, a good point. It is kind of, maybe maybe it is kind of intimidating sometimes. And it kind of is kind of like even threat, like a vulnerable place to go into to be like, okay, so I, I identify as a musical expert and I'm an expert on my instrument. I'm an expert teacher, but this is this whole new domain that maybe I haven't explored yet. I think it's important that we just be okay, you know, like be honest with ourselves about where we are with that. Like you can, you can still be an expert in all the things you're an expert in, but beginning onto a new field and eventually the, the holes will fill. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, this is my, this is my first fall teaching but I, I have to teach piano, guitar, orchestra, and then I go to an elementary school and I teach band and orchestra oh there. God. So I think, I, personally, <laughs> I see our fields <laughs> as music educators. How in the world? How in the world? So you're saying oh. that you need to be versatile. You have to be versatile, and I think all you of the stuff that you're giving us helps us see that, and, and we, we should embrace it and go, yes, this is fun, this is what our kids want, and thank you for giving us tools to be able to branch out. As, as educators and not be rigid in our thinking of, well, I, I know how to play my instrument, I'm a string teacher, but instead, no, I'm a music teacher, and I'm gonna encounter a lot of kids yeah. that have different yeah. interests, like your right, bass right, and right. second violinist. Right, 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 sure, yeah. Uh -huh. I think, too, um, our culture has changed a lot drastically by media, by everything being so instant. It's changed, the band program has changed the orchestra program. Yesterday I went to Arcadia High School to see Max's lab. Oh my God, it was incredible. His kids not only write their own music, they produce it, they have their, it was incredible to witness. They, it was their homecoming. The marching band wasn't playing for the football game. This, his, his class was. They, um, they have flutes, they have guitar, they have, you know, it's incredible if you get to see that, but more, the reason I'm adding that to my curriculum, the Common Core, how many of you have been in a meeting and heard that now that you have to include the Common Core in your curriculum, right? The creative thinking, well guess what? 
this is absolutely right, right in there, reflecting, being creative. Um, it, it hits all the math literacies and the EOA, the English literacies. This is a perfect vehicle to do what we do anyway, to create uh, kids to play and to do what we do, expanding orchestra to another level. And I just can't. Chris came in and did a concert at my school. I hired some local musicians for the rhythm section. They came in at night. We put Christian in the rhythm section in the center, put my kids on the outside. They sat there and were totally immersed in a whole new culture that they had never experienced. And the parents, too, and the principals. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, and I do, I know people are skeptical about some of this stuff, too, because, you know, there, there is... There are snake oil salesmen in this field. You know, it's been a very murky kind of thing for like 10 years, you know. I mean, like, you know, alternative styles, what is it? And it's, sometimes it's, it's, it's sort of like sold hard, pushed hard, but there's not really any concrete substance behind it. Behind it. I will say that, you know, my residencies that I do are when I, when I perform as a guest artist. It is about the kids having the experience. You know, it's not just about me showing up and like, look at me, you know. And, uh, you know. <laughs> but, um, Tell them about what the little girl came up and said to you. Well, she said something like that. I broke it down, and it really helped. You know, that she felt like I really broke it down, and she, she learned a lot about music. I think that was the, the main thing, as wow. opposed to other experiences she had had where it was all about the guest artist or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, she had a little autistic cellist. She posted on Facebook that night. She said, "I finally broken through. I was able to solo. My Christian held the mic to my cello. I did it. Wow. It made me cry when I." <laughs> That's cool. Well, um, thank you so much. If, if you'd like to talk to me more or whatever, I'm very accessible. The flyers I gave you, hopefully you got some flyers on my Creative Strings Academy or the workshop. My cell phone number's there. My email's there. You can find me on YouTube. Uh, if, you, if I can help with anything, if you want to talk to me today or, or, or later. But I know that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Ma Matthew Speaker is going to be, be coming up here in a few we'll minutes. We'll need just a couple minutes break to set up an LCD projector. But thank you, Professor. <laughs>